Please open your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 19. Our text for this Good Friday is found in verses 1 through 42. Today we're going to be focusing on the various aspects of Christ's suffering which are woven together throughout the whole of this chapter, which we will examine one section at a time. And so let's begin by reading through the first 16 verses in our text, beginning in verse 1. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. For I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die, because he has made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement, and in Aramaic, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to them, to be crucified. It's ironic, as we read these words, to find that the pagan Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, had more pity in his heart for Jesus and had a greater sense of justice than the chief priests and the religious leaders of the Jews. Pilate, realizing that Jesus was innocent, sought to release him and even appears to be afraid at the thought that Jesus might be more than just a man? When the religious leaders say that we have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he has made himself the Son of God. Pilate ran back to Jesus to ask him, Where are you from? This question wasn't simply one of curiosity about the place Jesus was born. It was a question about his origin, whether he was divine, whether he came from outside of this world. And so on the, on the one side, you have Pilate, who out of his awareness of Jesus' innocence and out of his fear that Jesus might be divine, he, he seeks to let Jesus go. And then, out on the other hand, you have the religious leaders who are experts in the very law of God in Scripture, all of which pointed to Jesus. And yet they're demanding the crucifixion of their long-awaited Messiah and of their King, 
Even after Pilate has Jesus brutally flogged and then parades Jesus before them in, a, in an attempt, a twisted attempt to, to pacify their hatred and getting around putting him to death, they, they still had no pity for Jesus whatsoever, but only demanded to have him crucified. In the end, Pilate feared man more than he feared God. And Pilate desired his own position more than he desired to do what was right. For when the Jews cried out in verse 12, if you release this man, you're no friend of Caesar's, Pilate brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat to pronounce the verdict. And Pilate delivered Jesus over to them to be crucified. The story continues from the end of verse 16 through to verse 27. So they took Jesus, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them, Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture, which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. Now, it's remarkable just how little John tells us about the crucifixion itself. He really gives us almost no details at all except to simply state in verse 18 that they crucified him. John Stott, in his classic work, The Cross of Christ, explained that if we had to rely exclusively on the Gospels, we would not have known what happened. But other contemporary documents tell us what a crucifixion was like. The prisoner would first be publicly humi humiliated by being stripped naked. He was then laid on his back on the ground, while his hands were either nailed or roped to the horizontal wooden beam, and his feet to the vertical pole. The cross was then hoisted to an upright position and dropped into a socket which had been dug for it in the ground. Usually a peg or rudimentary seat was provided to take some of the weight of the victim's body and prevent it from being torn loose. But there he would hang, helplessly exposed to intense physical pain, public ridicule, daytime heat, and nighttime cold. The torture would last several days. None of this is described by the gospel writers. The evangelists give no details of the crucifixion. They make no reference at all to hammer or nails or pain or even blood in the crucifixion. All we are told is they crucified him. It was a, bar a barbaric death a death that was reserved for the worst criminals and the lowest slaves. At the foot of the cross, 
The soldiers divided his clothing and gambled for his tunic. Scholars explain that it was a perk for the soldiers on execution duty to have the right to claim the victim's clothes. The squad of executioners had four men, but a Jewish man typically wore five items of clothing. A belt, sandals, head covering, outer robe, and an undergarment. So after each soldier claimed one item of clothing, they decided to gamble for the fifth and final item, his tunic. Now, some have tried to make a big deal out of Jesus' seamless robe, claiming that the reason the soldiers gambled over this robe was because it was so incredibly valuable. But the point here isn't the value of Jesus' clothes. The point is the fact that when Jesus laid down his life for us, he truly gave everything. Even his clothes were taken from him. And this had been foretold in Scripture. After describing this act by the soldiers, John draws our attention to a group of women standing by the cross. Jesus' mother Mary, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Now it's almost certain that Joseph was dead by this time, and therefore that Mary, Jesus' mother, was actually a widow. And so Jesus, as the firstborn of the family, had the responsibility of taking care of his mother. And knowing that he was about to die, Jesus did take care of his mother by entrusting her to the care of a beloved disciple who was also standing nearby. He said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And what Jesus meant by that was clearly understood by them. For from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. This is a beautiful moment in the middle of a very dark scene. As the compassionate heart of Jesus is on display, when even in the midst of his suffering and agony on the cross, Jesus tenderly cares for his mother in his dying moments. Next, in verses 28 through 30, we read that after this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Jesus was given a sponge full of sour wine on a hyssop branch. The very thing that the Israelites of old used on the night of the very first Passover in Egypt when they applied the blood of a lamb to the doorposts of their houses thousands of years before. After receiving the sour wine, Jesus cried out, it is finished, using an expression that means something was fully accomplished or completed. It was a word that was often written on bills and on receipts in order to show that the debt that was owing has been fully paid, nothing left owing. Which means that Jesus, when he gave his life, he shouted that the debt of our sin was completely paid and completely satisfied, that there's nothing left owing. Everything that was necessary for the forgiveness of sin and everything that was necessary for our acceptance before God had been fully accomplished and paid for. That there is nothing now left to be done except to receive God's salvation by surrendering to Christ in faith. To receive the gift. To believe, to embrace, to cherish the gift. Lastly, in verses 31 through 42, we read that since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first, 
and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear. And at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness, his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you also may believe. For these things took place that the Scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another Scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden was a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there, The glaring hypocrisy of the Jewish leaders continues in these final words. For it was a day of preparation. It, it was the day before a very special Sabbath. And therefore the Jews didn't want to leave the bodies remaining on the cross, lest the land be defiled according to the law. But this concern was a glaring contradiction of their previous actions, for they had just expressed the defilement and corruption of their hearts by falsely condemning the Messiah and by rejecting God Himself as their King. So in their pretense and in their false display of religious devotion, they asked Pilate to shatter the legs of those who had been crucified so that they would die quickly by suffocation as they would no longer be able to push themselves up with their legs to breathe. That way they could remove their, their dead bodies from the crosses and throw them out into a, a common grave as trash to keep the land clean, of course. And that's what Pilate did. He gave the order and the soldiers proceeded to break the legs of the two criminals. But when they came to Jesus, they were surprised when they found that he was already dead. So they didn't break his legs. He was dead because nobody took his life from him. He gave it when he had finished paying the price for our redemption. But because they needed to guarantee that all of their victims were dead and that they had completed their job, they pierced his side with a spear from which blood and water poured out. Now this is a peculiar incident. And it not only proved that Jesus had truly died by the separation that occurred, but throughout church history it was also recognized that this was a symbol of the double cure that Jesus accomplished for us in His death. The blood symbolized the forgiveness of our sins in our justification, the moment when we are made right with God through faith when we first believed. And the water symbolized the cleansing of our souls throughout our lives in sanctification as we are transformed and made more like Jesus throughout our lives, both of which are essential aspects of our salvation. 
There's no coming to Christ for salvation without being made like Christ through sanctification. Now the Romans, they preferred to leave their victims hanging on the cross as a warning to all. This also extended the suffering and the agony which left alone could, could continue for days. Obviously the breaking of legs would expedite the process of death. But they allowed this to happen so that the bodies could be removed out of Jewish concern for ceremonial purity. Jesus' legs were not broken to fulfill the scripture that none of his bones would be broken. But whenever bodies would be taken down from crosses, they would, they would then be thrown into a common gravesite outside the city. This would have happened to Jesus were it not for two very unlikely people who boldly came forward at a very unlikely time. Joseph of Arimathea was a wealthy man and a member of the Jewish council. Previously, he had been a secret disciple because he had been afraid to identify openly with Jesus. But in the shadow of Jesus' sacrifice, Joseph's fear gave way to a courageous faith, and he boldly goes to the man who just had Jesus executed and requested that Jesus' body be released to him. Pilate granted his request, and Joseph buried Jesus in his own grave, a rich man's tomb where no one had been laid, again in fulfillment of Scripture. Now along with Joseph of Arimathea, another prominent Jew also came forward. Nicodemus, a Pharisee who had previously met with Jesus secretly at night, but who now honors Jesus boldly and extravagantly by preparing Jesus' body for burial with 75 pounds of spices. In choosing to honor Jesus in this way, both of these prominent religious men knowingly defiled themselves under the law by handling a dead body, leaving them ceremonially, ceremonially unclean. This is in complete contrast with the religious leaders who refused to enter Pilate's headquarters out of fear of defiling themselves, even though they were plotting the murder of the Son of God, and who also wanted the bodies of those who were crucified to be removed for fear of defiling the land, even though they had just carried out the greatest act of sin and of hatred against God in human history. Their example is a sobering reminder that it is never enough to be merely religious. For many hide the evil of their hearts behind a religious appearance, even behind a life of religious service. Our only refuge is not by being religious. It's to run to Jesus for refuge from the corruption of our own sin, our own fallen hearts, by repenting of sin and by believing the gospel so that we follow Jesus with genuine love and true faith. That is our refuge. These two men at the end of our text, who were once too afraid to publicly identify with Jesus, were changed by his sufferings on the cross. And their faith became evident. This is the way that it ought to be, not only with them, but with us as well. For the one who went through all of this suffering and agony is the very God that made us, is the very God who holds our lives in his hands. He's the very God that we've sinned against. More times than we can count. And therefore, He is the very God from whom we deserve judgment. He is the one who has so loved us in the way that we see here at the cross as He willingly comes to this earth 
taking on a true humanity in order to be able to lay down his life in death in order to bear our sins, to take the record of our guilt on himself and be treated as we deserve so that he could take the judgment we deserve away from us, so that he could rescue us from the guilt and the power of our sin and remove the hostility inside the hostility in our hearts against God so that we no longer run from Him in rebellion, but to Him in faith and in love. This is why Jesus died. This is why the cross is at the heart of our faith. This is why we remember and rejoice in His death and boast in the cross where our Lord died to make us His own. Because by it, the glory of God is revealed and by it, we experience the very life of God both now and forever. Let's pray.